Uh, my name is Corinna Cizona. I am a developer, a developer evangelist, and an advocate. I'm the founder of Callback Women, among other things, and I really like to talk about the unintended consequences we have of ordinary decisions we make as programmers, and that's what this talk is really going to be dealing with as well. In particular, this talk is a toolkit for empathetic coding. We're going to be delving into some specific examples of uncritical programming and the painful results from doing things in ways that are initially really just benignly intended. And because I want to deal with empathy, I want to start here with a content warning for all of you. I'll be delving into some examples that deal with pretty sensitive topics, including grief, PTSD, depression, miscarriage, infertility, sexual history, consent, surveillance, racial profiling, and the Holocaust. And while none of these are the main topic, they will come up. So uh, that's starting about five, 10 minutes. You've got a little time to decide whether that's of interest to you or not. Uh, I hope you will stay. I think you'll find it really interesting. So. We are able to extract remarkably precise insights about an individual these days. The question is, do we have a right to know what they didn't consent to share with us, even when they've shared something willingly that led us there? And then we have to ask ourselves, how do we mitigate against unintended consequences from doing that? It helps to start with just asking a general question of what is an algorithm? Defined just very generically, it's a step-by-step -step set of operations for predictably arriving at an outcome. And predictably is going to end up being something that's really key for us today. So step-by-step -step set of operations for predictably arriving at an outcome. So if, of course, typically when we're talking about algorithms, we mean something that's patterns of instructions that are being articulated in code or perhaps in mathematical formulas. But you can also think of them as algorithms are throughout everyday life. They are just patterns of instructions that can be articulated in various ways, such as, for instance, a recipe, or instructions, maps, directions. Even a crochet pattern is an algorithm as well, and I would argue a lot more complicated than your average code. So deep learning is the new hotness right now for mining data using artificial intelligence, specifically the branch of artificial intelligence that's machine learning. So essentially, deep learning is algorithms for fast, trainable artificial neural networks. It's a branch of machine learning that's been around for a few decades, at least since the 1980s, but mostly in theoretical scale and mostly really trapped in academia. But in recent advances, just in the past couple of years, since around 2012, 13, deep learning has now become realistically able to extract insights out of the vastness of deep, uh, big data. And we're talking about in production live. So it's a particular approach to building and training ANNs. And what you can do is think of this as decision-making black boxes. So that's really at its heart all this D uh, DL is. Um, it's driving major advances right now in a number of areas, including data analysis and visualization, uh, NLP, sentiment analysis, computer vision, including even things like self-driving cars. And it's just basically, you can think of it as you're throwing in some inputs, just an array of inputs that are representing a something. And it could be, you know, for instance, language, words, documents, um, images, uh, just doing whatever operations on that. And what you're looking for is that the deep learning actually is coming up with a prediction from the training data set that you give it about what kind of properties in the future could be used to draw intuitions about data you give it that's similar to that initial training set. And as you can see, that would lead to some interesting little dependencies there. You have to have that tight coupling between the training data set and the one that you use in the future at much larger scale. Today we'll be looking at some use cases that include things like behavioral prediction, image classification, face recognition, and sentiment analysis. So let's take a step back for just a second and go back to that summary. Deep learning relies on an ANN's automated discovery of patterns within the training data set. It's not looking at labeled data, it's not looking at classified data, it's simply looking at jumble of data and intuiting patterns that may exist within it and trying to assign something to that. It applies those discoveries to draw intuitions about future inputs. And that's kind of abstract to think about, so I wanted to show you a neat little example here. This is Mario. It's an ANN that teaches itself how to play Super Mario World. It starts with absolutely no clue whatsoever. It is not given instructions. It's not given rules. It's not given the concept of gameplay at all. It knows nothing about its world. All it does is manipulate numbers and observe what happens. 
and it observes that sometimes things change. And over a period of iterations of doing this, in increasingly granular layers, it starts to ferret out patterns. And by the end of 24 hours of doing this just investigative series of iterations, it's learned how to play the game and win. This is what we're dealing with right now, fascinating new breakthroughs. <clears throat> so what does this tell us about the ability to predict some insights for other kinds of data? Well, let's try playing a game and we'll find out. It looks a little bit like bingo, and it's called data mining fail. <clears throat> Insightful algorithms are full of pitfalls, and by looking at case studies, it's easier for us to explore some of the pitfalls that you can see here on the board. And uh, let's just try taking a peek at a few. First one is target. So in the retail sector, the second trimester of pregnancy is known as the holy grail. Why would that be? In the second trimester of pregnancy, a person's buying habits are, for one of the very few times in their life, completely up for grabs. They will change their product loyalty, their brand loyalty, their store loyalty, and start afresh. Which means that if a retailer can get that person to start buying at their store during that pivotal time, then they are locking in a consumer for potentially the rest of their life, as well as that families. This is a really pivotal, powerful moment. So of course, they're very interested in discovering who is in that second trimester of pregnancy. It's a lot easier for merchandisers to identify that around the third trimester, but second was hard. Target one day had some marketers go to one of the programmers and just ask, you know, hey, do we have something to do? What do you think? Is there some way we can use the data to figure this out? Guy came up with an algorithm. They started sending out mailers. Something like this. Full of things that you need when you are pregnant, when you are expecting a baby, when you will soon have an infant in your home. Um, that seemed to be going pretty well, right up until a guy came into a store, raged. How dare you? How can you send this to my teenage daughter? Are you trying to tell her to have sex? manager apologized, of course. It's not like he created this. He probably had absolutely no idea why he was being yelled at, but understandably apologized. The man went away. He came back the next day and he said, I owe you an apology because I've had a conversation with my daughter and it turns out there's some things I didn't know. She is in fact pregnant. So the algorithm worked, right? Success. Was that girl ready to have a conversation that day? Was that her moment? Was it right that an algorithm forced her to have that conversation with an angry parent of all things? This is an algorithm stealing something from people. Their right to say something that's the most important news of their life. So Target did learn a few things from this. What they learned is to change the way they send out those ads. Instead, it's something like this. Uh, they bury them. They send out a mailer full of other random things as far removed from seeming to be related as possible. So, you know, for instance, now you might get coupons for diapers and for men's cologne. No chance that that's targeting you because you're pregnant, right? They found that they really liked this idea because as long as a pregnant woman thinks she hasn't been spied on, as long as we don't spook her, it works. Shutterfly also was very interested in this moment when people have babies, right? Again, spending power. So they identified some people and sent out some emails. Hey, congratulations on your lovely new bundle of joy. Time to buy some cards from us. The thing is, their targeting was a bit off. They had some false positives in there. Some of them were people saying, you know, I'm a dude, so, ha ha. Uh, some people had a little bit different feedback. Thank you, Shutterfly, for the congratulations on my new bundle of joy. I'm horribly infertile, but hey, I'm adopting a kid, so. 
I lost a baby in November who would have been due this week. It was like hitting a wall all over again. There were many people with feedback like this. Shutterfly responded, the intent of the email was to target customers who had recently had a baby. Yes, we know. That's not an apology. That's not even really an explanation. It is not learning something. The point is that your targeting failed. And what is the cost of a false positive here? A few months ago, Mark Zuckerberg excitedly announced that he's going to be a father. He also used that blog post to announce that he and his wife Priscilla had also had a series of miscarriages that preceded this and that they'd had to deal with as a couple. He wrote, you feel so hopeful when you learn you're going to have a child. You start imagining who they'll become and dreaming of hopes for their future. You start making plans and then they're gone. It's a lonely experience. Facebook year in review. That's been around for quite a while. <clears throat> Every year they kind of tweak how they handle it. The basic principle being uh, at the end of the year, wouldn't you like to revisit some of your posts from the past year that have been particularly special in some way? Maybe they had a bunch of likes, maybe a lot more commenting than usual. Whatever it was, here they are again for you to relive the past year. Last year they got particularly algorithmic about doing this, uh, selecting them for you. What they failed to take into account is that lives change. Even if something started off being a joyous moment, by the time the end of the year comes around, our relationships change, our jobs change, how we feel about past things has changed. You can't just say that based on some metrics of what happened to a post back when, even if back when was yesterday, that you know how people feel about it today. So what happens when you're wrong? Eric Meyer coined the term inadvertent algorithmic cruelty, which he defines as the result of code that works in the overwhelming majority of cases but doesn't take into account other use cases. Why does he get to name it? Because he's one of the people that it happened to. This is a picture of my daughter who is dead, who died this year. The year in review ad keeps coming up in my feed, rotating through different fun and fabulous backgrounds as if celebrating her death. And there is no obvious way to stop it. Eric asked us to increase awareness of and consideration of the failure modes, the edge cases, the worst case scenarios. And that's obviously what I'm trying to do here today, and I hope that you will bring forward when you leave here to others. That's really the best message that we can take, is to be thinking about these much harder. With that in mind, here's my first recommendation for us all. Be humble. We cannot intuit interstate emotions, private subjectivity. Not yet, anyway. Fitbit probably know it well as a little device to help you do things like track how many steps you take, how many miles you've traveled, how many whatevers you've done physically. Uh, and when it first emerged, it had among those things you could track your sex life. Uh, there was a little glitch in as much as it was default public. <laughs> this is what happens when we treat data as essentially all neutral. One algorithm applied to all data as if all data is the same. All we're doing as a device is collecting data and helping people gamify it and make it socially fun and competitive, right? Didn't think through how data differs, that sometimes we collect data for reasons other than public consumption. So, how did Fitbit users find out? They found out from the internet that their information was as public as that. Um, <laughs> this is so fun. So they fixed it. Uh, they didn't address 
the sort of core problem there. What they did instead is they no longer have sex tracker, which is a shame because I'm also a certified sex educator and this is legitimately useful information for a variety of reasons. So really just being unable and, or unwilling to deal with differences in data is cheating users out of something that started off there and could have been valuable. And no one's really willing to touch that third rail and that's a shame. Uber. So of course most of us need some form of internal ops tools. This is a given, right? It may be for monitoring, performance tuning, business metrics, whatever it is. Uber's is known as Godview. And in early iterations it looked like this. Just tracking the vehicles, passengers, people waiting, having an overall picture of how things are out there on the roads. But Uber didn't limit access to admins or restrict it to operational uses. Employees could freely identify any passenger and monitor that person's movement in real time. Drivers used to have access to those Godview records too, to see things other than the transaction that they were involved in, to see passengers other than those that they had personally taken somewhere. Even a job applicant was welcome to access these incredibly private records. Meanwhile, even managers felt free to abuse Godview for non-operational purposes such as stalking celebrities' rides in real time and showing it off as party entertainment. This is from their own Facebook post. Abuse of algorithms is also imposing consequences. We can have good tools written for good reasons, coming up with good analysis, and still being used in ways that are harmful. The research group at dating site OkCupid used to have a popular blog about things that they were learning from aggregate data trends. The blog would focus on sharing insights into just simple ways that as an OkCupid user, you could use the dating site to date better. Uh, Uber also used to blog about their data. Some differences, though, crucial difference. Uber's approach is not about improving customers' experience of their service. Look at this quote. Uber can and does track your one-night stands. It's tracking whether you've been near areas populated by prostitutes. This is invading people's privacy, not for any operational purpose, purely for the sake of judging and shaming them. And think back to all that access now and recontextualize that. All the people who have access to that kind of personal information. Google AdWords, um, there's an interesting study done by Harvard a couple of years ago. They took two uh, names of first names, two sets of first names. One highly correlated with African Americans and one highly correlated with white people. Uh, so an example name might say be Latanya versus Jill. And what they did is they ran searches on some sites that had AdWords uh, ads running. And they matched those first names against actual people who are genuine professors uh, who had that first name and some last name, so that they were searching for real people. And in searching for those real people with those highly racialized names, uh, they had some interesting findings. A black identifying name was 25% more likely to result in an ad that implied that real person had an arrest record. Examples like this. It's important to remember what AdWords algorithm is for because it focuses purely on predicting what we'll click on. That's it. It doesn't care about the real world. This isn't saying anything about the reality of whether anyone's being arrested at all. Although certainly as an end user, you probably aren't thinking that. Its job purely is to make us click. It takes blank ad templates, throws them out there randomly, and then watches which ones people click and gets reinforcement that it uses to keep on sending those ones back out. So what we see here is our collective bias being both reflected to us and reinforced by us. Data is generated by people. It's never objective. It's constrained by our tunnel vision it's replicating our flaws, it's echoing our preconceptions. Google Photos and Flickr. This is where we get into fun image recognition stuff. Like this one. 
We've been seeing facial recognition technology and consumer technology for a few years now, and we've seen some pretty funny mistakes happen along the way, such as early versions of iPhoto helpfully detecting, you know, a little face in your cookie. Why not? It's a harmless mistake. It's actually pretty funny. It's a false positive, but you know, unlike some of the other ones we've seen, it's a harmless false positive, so it's really easy to chuckle at. Some mistakes are not funny, though, such as in this next photo. Flickr classified this just a few months ago as children's playground equipment. This is the Dachau concentration camp. The white tags you see at the right are Flickrs. The gray ones are the photographer zone. This is an algorithm that's not only wrong and totally fails at meaning, but this is an algorithm treating human knowledge of meaning as irrelevant. It's substituting machine intuition as more important and valuable and treating data as if it's inherently neutral. Flickr tagged him not only as an animal, but originally it also had a tag here as ape. This, I think as we all know in the US, is a particularly problematic comparison with a really ugly history. Here a month later is Google Photos making virtually the same mistake. So how does this happen? These are enormous companies that are dedicated to this kind of work, right? Like this isn't an easy mistake. And it's really unlikely that it's something to scale that there's one rogue employee who's inserting racism into the algorithm. Sure, it's possible. But what are some other reasons why this might happen? Well, one answer, you have to go all the way back to the 1950s to understand. In the 1950s, uh, Kodak was uh, creating color film. And as part of that, you needed to be able to have reliable color results. And that means you have to make choices about what colors you want to render and in what level of detail. And Kodak favored rendering as much detail as possible in white skin, specifically. And so lab technicians, every day, would start their day with what was called the Shirley card, a photo of a woman with nice pale white skin. And the idea was that every day you ran through sample photos and made sure that Shirley's skin features were all perfectly replicated and all the colors were well balanced. Making sure that black skin was well exposed was not on the agenda. And in fact, for decades, black skin photos were always very poorly rendered. It wasn't getting good detail. It wasn't gathering the level of detail and data that we have for photos of white skinned people for generations now. So what does that mean? It means that in these training data sets, remember the training data set has to be something like the live production one you're gonna use. We have terabytes of data being used for training data sets, but it's made of data full of junk. Data that looks to us as though it has equal quality of photographs of white and black skin, and it does not. Even today with digital sensors, it's not as though photography companies could have just reinvented sensors and had photos suddenly reproduce images in completely different fashion. We would all have been screaming that digital photography sucks. Look at how awful these photos are, completely different than my really nice SLR. We are living with the legacy of a decision, an algorithm that is decades old, generations old, and it will continue to be a problem because we still have data that is junk. A firm is a highly specialized consumer lending company. It is using big data to determine credit worthiness for buying certain consumer goods. Um, basic principle here is that they gather just a few data points and from that are able to make a number of decisions. So just basically your email address, your mobile number, birthday, uh, social security number, this is enough for them to then go deep diving into big data all over. And when it does so, it looks at a very, uh, a, they say 70,000 data points is what their algorithm looks like. Uh, their nice black box algorithm. Uh, and if they find that that's not enough, they'll ask you to voluntarily provide more information from sources, for instance, like GitHub. Okay, well, here's a problem. Only 2% of open source contributors are women. So as soon as you start using a criteria like GitHub participation, already this algorithm is going to be creating bias that is totally unaccounted for here. 
And how many of those other metrics likewise have bias that's unnoticed? Also, well, I can't even see from here. Okay, so it's also looking at behavioral factors, such as how long someone takes to remember that kind of basic information or to read the terms of service. Um, and that seems like, oh, it might be pretty good. You know, are they like trying to reach for it or make up a date, right? This might be something. Um, unless, say, you're someone who has some sort of cognitive disorder, Stephen Hawking clearly is a terrible credit risk. Um, so are many other people. For instance, parents. This is algorithms replicating privilege, finding it, and replicating even more. Congratulations, you're getting, you're getting true positives, but the rate of false negatives is so high, and all of those people being unnecessarily excluded who could be participants and potentially are really suffering from being excluded like this. Where is comprehension of meaning in context in this stuff? Without it, bias is always going to run rampant. A firm analyzes things like those social media accounts, but they're not the only ones. There's a number of others. In 2012, Germany's biggest credit, rage, re, sorry, credit rate, rating agency considered applicants Facebook relationships. And Facebook itself has recently defended a patent that pushes this even further into making credit decisions about a person based on the unrelated credit history of your Facebook friends. This is nuts. It's like even Facebook doesn't understand that Facebook friends and real life friends are not necessarily the same friends. But bigger than that, you're being assigned credit or blame based on something that you have no control over. Here's an algorithm with potential to deeply intrude on and alter relationships just so people can make sure that their financial choices are isolated from friends they care about who don't have the same ability to make good choices. This is the CEO of a firm. He says it's important to maintain the discipline of not trying to explain too much uh, because adding some assumptions could introduce bias into the data analysis. What? <laughs> data is not objective. It always has bias. It's inherent at minimum from how the data is collected and interpreted in the first place. Every flaw, every assumption in a data training set and the original functions, they're all, of course, having unrecognized influence on algorithms and the outcomes they generate. A firm says its algorithm assesses 70,000 personal qualities. How many of those have potential for discriminatory outcomes? How would anyone know? It's not like they know. They're proud that they don't know. It's not something where you'll ever be able to say, what was the criteria under which I was denied a loan? Rationales for the algorithm can only be seen from inside the black box. So I took a picture of the inside of a black box. <laughs> Making lending decisions inside of a black box is not a radical new business model. It's a regression. It's disrupting fairness and oversight. We're in an arms race right now. Google, Facebook, Apple, so many other companies, they are all committing to big bets on deep learning and its opaque intuitions. And for the moment, quality obviously varies. But remember, the whole point is that deep learning is all about iteratively drawing intuitions at extremely fine-grained levels and learning which means that it's getting more precise every day in its correctness and more damaging in its wrongness. That's a dilemma for all of us to take seriously as developers. Algorithms always have underlying assumptions about meaning, about accuracy, about the world in which they're generated, about how code should assign meaning to them, which means that underlying assumptions influence outcomes and consequences being generated. We do care about getting this stuff right. We want to be empathetic coders. There's no question. So the question becomes then, how do we flip the paradigm? Well, we can do some things like looking at what the professional ethicists say. Here are a few guidelines that I've adapted from the Association for Computing Machinery and from some various other sources. First, we have to consider decisions for potential impact on others, such as how might a false positive affect someone? How might a false negative affect someone? 
How might an algorithm's intuition be seemingly correct and yet deeply wrong about human context? Project the likelihood of consequences while we're planning. Minimize negative consequences to others. In early stages, be thinking about these things. We have to be honest and be trustworthy. And we do this, of course, because we simply want to be those kinds of human beings. But we have to be overtly honest and trustworthy so that users know and have built belief in us that when we do eventually screw up, which we will, that they can trust us when we say it was an honest mistake. We are sorry, we are fixing it. We will make sure that this does not happen again. Because if we have not done that work in advance, we will have a much bigger collapse. We have to build in recourse. That's the ability for people to be able to say, you've made a mistake, here's what to do to fix it. In almost all of these examples, users have nothing they can do. It's important to always build in recourse for someone to easily correct a conclusion that was wrong. We have to provide others with full disclosure of limitations and call attention to signs of risk of harm to others. And you'll notice I keep saying to others, to others, to others, because we're good at taking care of ourselves and our companies. Part of this whole flipping the paradigm has to be thinking about outside of that. We have to be visionary about creating more ways to counteract bias, bias in data, analyses, impacts, across the board. And finally, we need to anticipate diverse ways to screw up. Because as long as teams are charged with defining data collection and use, are anything less diverse than the intended user base, we will keep failing them. We have to have decision-making authority in the hands of highly diverse teams. Culture fit is the antithesis of diversity. Superficial variations are allowed to exist. They're tolerated. But their unique perspective is suppressed because the whole point of groupthink is to avoid disrupt, I'm sorry, of culture fit is to disrupt, avoid disrupting groupthink. Unidimensional variety is also not diversity. This is diversity. It's wildly varied on as many dimensions as possible, differing origins, differing ages, assumptions, experiences, where there's no longer an identifiable majority. That's when we have diversity. We are such a long way away from that. We have to cultivate informed consent. Ask permission with the default being no. Focus on the many people who are eagerly wanting to share themselves are enthusiastic about giving consent to be no more and serve better. There are plenty of people who would have loved coupons like those. Ask, why are we so reflexively going to let's invade privacy instead of asking people whether they would love to have it? We also have to audit outcomes constantly. And what that means is, uh, this is stuff that's widely used to look for, for instance, housing discrimination and uh, employment discrimination. Essentially, you put in two sets of inputs that are identical on all but one axis. So for example, two sets of resumes, exactly identical except for the name. And like that Harvard study, put them in, and you should have identical results. If the system is not biased on the basis of, say, your name, then those two should have exactly identical results. If they don't, then the algorithm is failing. The algorithm has to immediately be treated as suspect and corrected. That kind of auditing must happen regularly. Because again, all we've got is the photograph of an inside of a big black box. And that's why we have to also be willing to commit to data transparency and algorithmic transparency, both. And I know this is the hardest part of the conversation to have internally. Too many companies are obsessed with the idea that proprietary data and proprietary algorithms are the real special sauce of our companies, right? That's how we win. It wasn't that long ago that we had to have similar fights about open source software. That we need these in our toolkit. That proprietary tools are not, in fact, better for what we do. We pushed back. We were right. We won. We're professionals. We know that transparency is crucial for drawing insights that are genuine and useful. So it's worthwhile to start the conversations and be insistent. We can argue for increasing transparency because it's for the sake of better product, for cleaner features, for fewer bugs, stronger products overall, happier, loyaler users. 
Amy Hoy says, if your product has to do with something that deeply affects people, either care or quit. That's harsh words. But when you look at it, even something like Uber, as it turns out, deeply affects people. We all are working on stuff that does. It is so easy to unthinkingly build an out full of data mining fail. Building differently requires that awareness, that critical thinking, and most of all, deciding together as a team to take a stance to say, hey, listen, here's the deal. We do not build here without understanding consequences to others. This is just our process. This is our way. It's the right one. We're hired for more than just to code. We're not code monkeys. We're hired as professionals for our wisdom. We are professionals who apply judgment and expertise about how to solve problems. That is really what we do. We are problem solvers who put problem solving into code. Our role is to be opinionated about how to make code serve a problem space well. This is our territory. When we're asked to write code that presumes to intuit people's internal life and act on those assumptions as professionals, we have to be people's proxies. We have to be their advocates. We have to say no on their behalf to using their data in ways that they have not enthusiastically and knowingly consented to. We have to be the ones to say no to uncritically reproducing systems that were biased to begin with. Say no to writing code that imposes unauthorized consequences into their lives. Short. We have to refuse to play along. Thank you.